in, in Dandy. And, you know, it was a different scene back then. It was a lot of a lot of heroin, you know, especially around Springvale and Dandy Long Way. After 9-11, there was a general, there was a lot of prejudice against, you know, against Muslims. You get a ball, it, turn it into a quarter, turn it into an oka, it just goes up and up. So him and, and a bunch of people got patched up into the things. And we went to the clubhouse as kind of like, representing the boys inside that we were very close with. We changed from things to the Mongols when I was still on. Um, I actually became sergeant because of an internal political drama in, in our club. One of them got hit and then, you know, one of them was shot. And, and then sometimes you have to learn the hard way that not everyone can be trusted, you know what I mean? That actually, fuck, man, this, everyone's just in it for themselves. Hey, this is all just a fucking charade, do you know what I mean? Like, like I lost, like, I mean, I lost a bunch of friends to, to you know, in really brutal ways. All that talk to my gang pulled up, but we pull up and they all did. Yo, it's your boy King Dave here, and this is The Felon Show. Hope all is going well. Um, how about you introduce yourself, my man, and where you're from, guys? I'm Mahmoud Fazal. I'm a writer from Melbourne. Um, was raised around Dandy. Yeah, my man Mahmoud. Yeah. So um, <laughs> it's good to have you on, man. It's great to have you on. I've actually been on his podcast as well, man. So that was a huge honor, man. Uh, back then, man, doing me a mad solid. So the nah, first. Nah, bro. I'm, I'm just a, I'm, I'm a big fan of what you do, man. Like I think um. It takes it takes a lot of courage coming from where you come from, you know, to, to tell your stories. And, but yours is like the real gritty version of that. You know what I mean? You're, you're mm-hmm. kind of demystifying what society sees as as crime or criminals by you know putting them on a platform and having a fucking real conversation with them. Yeah, I, I really respect you for that, man. Ah, uh, thank you so much for the support, man. Appreciate the kind words, brother. Like, um, bro, you you inspire me, man. I swear. Like uh, um, when I looked into him, so um yeah, so the bro here is on. Uh, he's a journalist, man. He's been on like Vice News, ABC. Um, he's from the hood, though. You know what I mean? He's from Danny Nong, uh, from the southeast of Melbourne. You know what I mean? Like he's been for a bit himself, man. You know what I mean? He's been in the bikey scene. He's been in all sorts of different um, positions, man. So it's dope having you on, brother. Yeah, so how about you start us off, my bro? So um, where'd you grow up? Uh, I actually grew up in the suburbs. Like I grew up, um, I was first, my, my first, like the first house that my parents um, moved to was down Oakley Way, actually. Um, and then uh, we moved out, out near Glen Waverley and Willis Hill, like that side. Um, but my dad worked in um, the Dandy Markets. So I spent my weekends with my dad at the Danny markets every, every weekend. You know what I mean? So I was at school during the week, but on the weekends I'll be with, you know, with my dad in the markets and that. And as you know, there was, there was a big, um, big Afghan community in Dandenong. Um, So, you know, all of my cousins were always around there. It was just the, you know, all the grocery shops and all that were there. So I I, I was raised up, raised around there and, you know, I, I grew up in a time, it was kind of mid to late 90s was when I was a kid in, in Dandy. And, you know, it was a different scene back then. It was a lot of a lot of heroin, you know, especially around Springvale and Dandy Long Way. So it was pretty, it was pretty rough around, rough around the edges. And then when I hit my teens, it was more like a, it, we went through a kind of ice epidemic. And um, so there was a lot of that, that scene going on. There was always like gangs and shit. But yeah, I think it, it's always been known to just be a bit rough around the edges, I think. And, you know, you, you do what everyone in the, in the area is doing, you know what I mean? You just, that, that's just the way it is. So, you know, I got, got roped into that, but I was initially, I did, did pretty well in school. Initially I went to uni and then after uni, I couldn't get a job and all that. And then I just started fucking up. You know what I mean? I just started, got on the gear and that. And then, yeah, selling gear and all that stuff. And, you know, you kind of get, get caught up in the cycle. You know what I mean? You know what it is. Yeah, brother. Yep, I know what it is. I know what it is. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so can you sort of talk about your mindset, bro, of like um, finishing uni and not being able to find a job and then, um, you know, sort of falling into the drugs? Like, where was your mind down at that time? Man, you just kind of like a bit... You know, like I always, I always tell people, like in my in my community, like a lot of Muslims and and Afghans that I grew up with, man, like no one 
really had jobs. There was like one or two people that we knew in our whole community that had like a job, you know, even though a lot of, a lot of blokes went to, went to uni and all that, they tried to do the righty, you know what I mean? But they just, fuck, there was no opportunities there. But it's also like, if you look at it historically, like, you know, after 9-11, there was a general, there was a lot of prejudice against, you know, against Muslims in society. So there, it was hard, it was hard for, for blokes with names like Muhammad to get jobs, you know what I mean? And so, you know, and, and when you're from an area like Dandy, you know, you want, you want, you want what you haven't got and what no one around you's got. You want the hotted up super and skyline and all that. You know what I mean? Like, but there's only one way to get that when you're from a neighborhood like that. You know what I mean? Unfortunately, that's the reality of the situation. So, you know, the one bloke that's got the skyline or whatever, you're going to do what he did to get the skyline. You know what I mean? And so you just get caught up like that, man. Like, you know, you know, one person who's doing well, they, you know, it goes from, you know, same story, bro. Same story in every neighborhood. You know what I mean? You get a ball, it turn it into a quarter, turn it into an oco. It just goes up and up, and you start getting people to to come, and you start making money for your friends, and you start feeling good about yourself and reinforcing yourself that you know you're doing you're doing a good thing because now all you you and all your boys got money in their pockets too. You know what I mean? So, but really, at the end of the day, you know, you realize that it doesn't really amount to much. It's it, it's just. You know, it's just an escape route that you find real quick. You know what I mean? But it does it doesn't last very long. It's a fast life. You know? Yeah, that's right, brother. It's definitely a fast life. Um, you know, sort of painting a picture of Danny Long. You know what I mean? Yeah, there is a huge Afghan community there. Um, even like Eastern European, a lot of like Serbians mm. and Albanians and um, yeah, Islanders too. Uh, Africans. You go to high school, you hear about these older, you know, mythic characters. You know, and they're in the underworld or whatever and, and they're making big money and they're driving nice cars and all the girls are talking about them. And so you, you just aspire, to, you aspire to that because your heroes aren't like footy players. Do you know what I mean? Like they, they weren't our heroes in high school. Our heroes yeah. were, were the people on the news. You know what I mean? So, and I don't yeah. know why that is. I kind of, I don't have the answers for that. Like, I don't know. I don't know why, you know, our heroes were those guys. Our heroes were always the bad guys, but they were. So we just, we just did what we did. You know what I mean? Yeah, I'm not no, blaming can... society, man. Like I was a fuck up. Do you know what I mean? Like I'm, I'm yeah. not trying to shift the blame. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> yeah. You know what I mean? But no, I definitely get what you're saying, man. Even in Melbourne, there too, when I was there in high school, you know, I used to look up to the people in the newspaper. And I mean, eventually I did get to the point where I met went to prison and met all of them. You know what I mean? So <laughs> we both achieved our goals, I guess, you know. <laughs> But yeah, yeah, so okay, so you grow up in Danny Nong. Um, you're getting into slanging now. Um, meth mainly, I'm presuming. Yeah, um, yeah. So when did the sort of bikies sort of scene? When did you start hanging around bikies, bro? Uh, it ha- that that was always like we. I always knew certain people from different clubs growing up because you just wax with all different people, you know. Especially Melbourne, it's it's yeah. big, but in that in that it, once you hit a certain level, it's actually quite small. Everyone everyone yeah. kind of knows each other yeah. um and and so w- we grew up knowing this person was that was with that crew and that that person was with that crew we kind of kept our distance but then um there was one guy yeah, who we were i was very close with at the time and a relative of his who was in jail at the time he got patched up to a him and all of his boys got patched up into a club yeah, that, at that time, it was the Finks. So this was like early 2010s or something. Um, and yeah, so he, so him and, and a bunch of people got patched up into the Finks. And we went to the clubhouse as kind of like representing the boys inside that we were very close with, you know, yeah. um, to kind of sh- showing face on their behalf. And it was small. Like there, was, there wasn't, it was a small c- club you know um and i don't think from memory it had even been in melbourne for many years maybe like five years it it was a pretty new club in melbourne and it was kind of made up of all different clubs but so we went on their behalf and started hanging around and really got into it and then eventually um you know me me and two others uh we we at the time it was called nominee i think we nommed and then yeah. eventually we got our colours, man. And how long did it. you pos- how long did you nom for, brother? Not long. Um, 
there was a lot of there was a lot of um, things going on at the time, like the we got we got our colors after maybe four or five months, I would say, um, which was very fast. But that wasn't because I'm not trying to sit here and say like that's because we were the meanest motherfuckers in the world or anything like that. There was there was a lot of like poli- there was a lot of politics going on at the time, and you know a few things happened, and then we got our colors, but. Um, but like, even uh, I should say with all of this stuff, as you would know, and, and you've had a lot of bikies on your, on your show, like bikie clubs, like when you leave, they're, they're different. You know, I'm not, I'm not talking about, uh, I'm in no way making, saying like, I'm talking about all bikie clubs or, you know, do you know what I mean? Like I'm yeah. talking about my, the, my personal experience of my club at that time. Do you know what I mean? Now I don't, I don't know what the fuck goes on with the Finks or with the Mongols or anything like that. It's a different world now. And I don't even, most of the blokes on it aren't even, even there. So, mm. um, but when I was there, some, the, the, you know, like it was a really different time in the, in the early days because there was still like that. It was still the, the Nike bikey thing was like kind of, new it was it was kind of like and you could see like the old like hectic bikies from like fucking adelaide big beards like real rough fucking you know they looked like they carried guns from like colonial days or some shit you know what i mean and, but then there was but then like they would be partying in the same room with like cunts with like tns and gold chains and versace fucking bags and that so it was a weird it was a really interesting time to be involved in that world because like it was like an intersection, you know what I mean, of like the old guard and you and the, this new world, and and it was all changing. Uh, mm. It was all kind of it was becoming something else, you know. And um, all the clubs at that time in the early 2010s, so I'm, I'm I'm not sure if you remember, but but there was um, they were all vying for power, so that a lot of people were getting patched in, and, and clubs were expanding. Kind of like the height of the Nike bike thing. It was all over the news, you know. Yep. You know, when all these changes were happening and all these clubs were patching up, you know, a lot of people in prison actually were being patched up. And so yeah, I was going to say of, that. Yeah, so I remember yeah. as well. Even um, so, the Finks are a uh, nationwide gang. Um, well, international as well. Um, mm-hmm. but yeah, during the like, um, even when I went to prison, like you know, they were um patching up like crazy yeah and they were um, before they made their move to the mongols and even after then yeah so so then just as i i was actually the among the first in victoria to so the we changed from things to the mongols when i was still on on, i I believe my memory serves me correct so so i got my colors as a mongol not as a fink if that makes sense yeah so yeah. so we just we just we just changed and and then it kind of broke off and then some people stayed things and some people some people most most people actually changed because we got declared a criminal organization uh, in queensland a way of bypassing those laws they patched into a into a bigger club yeah 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 so the mongols mc that was i guess how they got their foothold in australia isn't it i think it was more of a political play than it was the the like a historical play do you know what i mean like i think that played a part in it like you know obviously the things had the same literal colors as the mongols and you know similar enemies but i I think it was more to do with the fact that you know it was a opportunity to expand and become a stronger club because you're part of an international outfit but also um literally because the finks were were going to be buried in court cases like the Mm. prime minister at the time gave the prosecution like a few like five million dollars extra don't quote me on that number but just to fight the the appeal in the in the high court or something so anyone who was a fink if they had stayed on they you know blokes were putting their houses up like to fight the court cases, man, like in Queensland, people, like all, like this was like real, like, you know, when people talk about like bike, bikers are a subculture, a lot of people look at that now and think like, that's bullshit. They're just like hiding their crimes or whatever, but it was a real culture. Like these, there was like live and live to die for their bike dudes. Like, so when some of the, I think almost every member in Queensland at one point was like selling their bikes and shit and like trying to raise money. Like they were literally, 
fucking at the front lines of an ideological war with the fucking government to, mm. you know, to, to be to be allowed to be part of a subculture. It's a pretty, pretty hectic thing, man. Yeah, but like no, there were no angels, yeah. obviously. They were they were, you know, people were committing crimes, but but it was pretty, pretty fucking wild. Yeah, to yeah. see, you know. Yeah, but you gotta think of the laws they passed. Like you just if you wear the same t-shirt as another bloke, it's straight jail. Like yeah. no corpse, nothing. Oh, like it's yeah. jail. Like if if three generations family members, like a dad, his son, and like his cousin or whatever, if they were having a beer at a pub together, that's jail straight away. It's not like so draconian. Like those those, it's against almost every human right imaginable. But yeah, just because no, you know. It, but yeah, there was a lot of similarities too with the way if you think about it, like in on a broader level, like conceptually. Um, the way that the government used, you know, terrorism as a kind of boogie monster to pass all these fucking laws, they mm. did the same thing with bikies. And they kind of do the same thing on another level with, like, sex offenders, do you know what I mean? Like, they'll say, they'll put it out there and be like, we're passing these laws because of sex offenders, because in our minds as a public, we say, oh, well, fuck them anyway. But then they start using those laws and normalising them across the spectrum you know, and you would know this firsthand, being imp- being imprisoned and stuff, and to yeah, the point even with the like, deportation, like um, that's exactly, yeah, exactly. what they did with uh, deportation. It was for um, like terrorists and all of that, and then yeah, the exactly. deportees got all caught up in it as well. So yeah, you're exactly right. Yeah, they just normalize it, and and the same with control orders. Like that was for for like high terrorists or extreme sex offenders, but now it's like I, I know people who are coming out of prison in New South Wales and they're being stuck with it's like normal to be on a control order now it's, yeah. It's, yeah yeah it's wild it's wild all right so yeah okay so yeah and so anyway um you started rolling with the finks um midway through you um well they patched over to the mongols you ended up becoming a member of the mongols so you ended up becoming sergeant at arms isn't it um during your time there so how did that sort of go? So how did it happen? Um, how did life sort of change for you after getting the patch, bro? Or like, how was life for you at that time? Man, it was, to be honest, it was pretty fun, bro. Like we weren't, a lot of me and my mates, we weren't working. You know what I mean? We were just partying. It was a good time, bro. You know, like I, I, I wish I could sit here and say that it was all drama and it was stressful and this and that. We actually had a mad one, like, Every weekend was was a good time. I, I, I had made a lot of strong friends at the time, but like like most things in this world, do you know what I mean? Like it, it doesn't matter what 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 side you enter it from. There's always going to be someone out there that wants to you know fuck with you. You know what I mean? And and eventually, like I I, I had a I, I feel as though from my perspective, I mean to my face. I was pretty cool with a lot of a lot of different people in Melbourne. Like I was, I was always on friendly terms with them and that. But you know that can only go so far, you know. And then you start attracting. I feel like it, from the club perspective, there was no, there was no drama, like no heat. It was actually, it was actually a fucking sick time, bro. But but then because I was a member of a club, I started attracting heat from from other situations. Do you know what I mean? And then there's a certain there's a certain way you have to kind of carry yourself because you're you've got a flag on your back. Do you know what I mean? Like you're carrying a flag now. So another situation where you would all, you would if you weren't part of a club, you could kind of let it go. Or do you know what I mean? Like or, yeah. it's hard to tell this without actually to going into specifics. Like situations where you'll probably be like, "Fuck it, let it go." You can't let it go. And then or other situations where cunts are jealous or they just you know they just want to find a reason because they they see that people people like admire the the whole bikey thing they they want to they want to you know they want to get at you for that or try and show show their their people that you ain't shit for that and so they'll try and put on and that it's it's just there's always drama but my drama didn't come from the club like other other clubs like or anything like that yeah i was cool with people from all different clubs like uh, i i had friendships with a lot of them but um my dramas came from i mean this is almost a fucking cliche like from your own people you know what i mean 
Like that, it's that's the same old story. I mean, I'm sure you probably heard it a million times. You know what I mean? My dramas did not come from anyone, not anyone else, but my own people. Do you know what I mean? They they were the ones that created the most drama for me. And it's like there's like that saying where it's it's never the boxer like you know at boxing matches that has the punch ones. It's always the boxer's like friend like that's, <laughs> that that ruins the reputation for the box or whatever. It's like that sort of yeah. shit. Like. I would always go out and have a mad time, but it would always be like one cunt on the periphery of our group or something that would get energized from some of the other blokes that were in the circle and, and create drama. Do you know what I mean? And then suddenly, you're, you know, a little fucking spark turns into, you know, a huge fire. You know what I mean? Yeah, for sure. I know what you mean. So, what you mean. Yeah. yeah. So it was little dramas like that, man. And then, yeah. So what? So like, how long did it take before you became sergeant, bro? I actually became sergeant because of an internal political drama in, in our club. That I can't even really go into it, but because there was an internal feud between, because we split into chapters. So so me and a couple of me and a bunch of guys were down west side in Werribee, and another another group was in. Um, Port Melbourne, and there was a there was a really there was an internal feud that happened. It wasn't really a feud, but it was two blokes kind of turned on each other. And one of them one of them got hit, and then you know one of them was shot, and, and then um, I kind of he got he had to, and then he he went to prison, and then so I kind of just stepped up. You know what I mean? I kind of got tapped to 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 to, to take that role. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, that, yep. that's kind of that's kind of what happened, and then it was just, just you know, you just have to do a bit more work on the on Friday nights and make sure there's order and just just a bit more responsibility in that. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's yep. all it was. But yeah, it's hard it's hard to tell tell these stories without going into specifics. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, no, no, I understand, brother. It's all it's all good. I understand. So um, so yeah, so from there. Like, uh, where did the sort of scene take you from there? I guess, like, um, there was like a, a bunch of drama that started happening, and um, basically, and like just to like, say as well, like, there was always in the newspapers as well, wasn't it? You know what I mean? Like, it was yeah, always yeah, coming yeah, up yeah, in the newspaper, yeah. things from prison as well. There was a whole bunch, yeah, of shit. I mean, there was a whole you, bunch of shit happening you in there. In prison, fucking honestly, whenever shit was getting red hot and you'd think it was just it was just like among in your small world bro blokes in jail like would call me with the goss like before i'd even heard it sometimes <laughs> do you know what i mean like yeah. fuck they had the news locked down bro it was like the bbc in there like as soon yeah. as anything happened i'd be getting phone calls like what happened with that what happened with this yeah. do you know what i mean yeah. so i don't know i don't know what the go what the go was with that but sometimes you have to learn the hard way that not everyone can be trusted. You know what I mean? Yeah. Sometimes you have to learn that the hard way, you know, I, I had to, I was very forgiving of, of situations and people and, and stuff. But then once you start learning, you know, that actually, fuck, man, this, everyone's just in it for themselves. Hey, this is all just a fucking charade. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. then you start being like, I don't need this, man. I'll go on, I'll be on my once. But then also to compare with that, you know, I was having a lot of like mental and psychological drama as well. Um, like I lost, like, I mean, I lost a bunch of friends to, to, you know, in really brutal ways. Do you know what I mean? Murders and that. So so uh, there was that, and then there was also me like losing, uh, uh, or not really losing sight of what I thought this world was, but but kind of making sense of the reality of the situation. Do you know what I mean? The reality is like there's only one objective. That's money. Do you know what I mean? And if you're if you're going to get in the way of that objective, even if your principles are in the right, do you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah it uh, it. it even if even if you're in the right with like with your principles, it just it just people don't give a fuck. You know what I mean? And 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 that that might be because of the the the, the men that I I was kind of brought in under. Like they had very hard line fucking old school kind of you know codes that they lived by. Do you know what I mean? And then suddenly you, you know you you let one thing go, you let other things go, and then it's like 
you're fucking reassessing who you are as a human being sometimes, you know what I mean? Because it's like, do you know what I mean? Like, if I let that go, man, I'm a fucking, like, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I know so, exactly what you mean, brother. Exactly what you so mean. Then, so then it's like, well, man, I don't know if this is, this is me. I don't know if this is, you know, this is the world I want to go yeah and then and then on top of that i was mourning the, the loss of my one of my best mates who who died in an accident um you know he and so it, i just i was like i need to do something better for myself you know what i mean i need to i need to figure myself out and just like take it take it back to square one which is like you know what do i want in life man maybe i'll just have a, like a little family or something you know, raise raise my own and just just keep away from all the drama and work and keep my nose clean and just move forward. Do you know what I mean? Man, the bravery that will had uh, for you to do that though, bro. You know what I mean? Like when you're when you're in the gang scene, man. Especially when you're deep into it and stuff, and um, you know the loyalties there and that to actually be able to step back and say, man, I need to start from square one again. Like, man, so, so many people right now in the gang scene just don't have the courage to do that, you know what I mean? And then they just keep losing themselves I, I further. Was, maybe I was just lucky, bro. I don't know. Do you know what I mean? I, yeah. Sometimes you find luck in, like, the most fucked up situations, do you know what I mean? And I might have just had that, you know what I mean? Like, yeah. and it's the same with you, bro. Like, like, look at what you're doing now. You had to go through fucking how many years in the slot and in jail and deportation and all that to fucking, you know, reassess and fucking reconstruct your whole, you know, phil- yeah. philosophy of life. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. like that's, that's, I'm just, I just feel like anyone that's in that world, cause it feel when you're in it, it feels like a closed circle. You know what I mean? You feel like there's no escape, but really it's like, it's not that deep. Like you can just, if you be, a, if you be a man about it and just say like, actually, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, uh, I don't know if this is me anymore. You know, that takes, that takes a man to say that, you know what I mean? No one, no one's going to be like, oh, in, in a, in a week's time, no one's going to give a fuck, but maybe like a few days cunts are, go, cunts are going to bitch about you. Do you know what I mean? But then who cares what they say anyway? Cause you, they, you're leaving that behind you. Do you know what I mean? You can't have both, you know, you can't, you can't, ha- you can't, re- you know, make, make yourself a, a different person like a, a, in normal society and still care about how you're viewed in that world. Do you know what I mean? That's an oxymoron. Do you know what I mean? Like, oxymoron. Exactly. Well, yeah, yeah. You yep. just have to fucking move on and, and can't, people are going to talk shit about you, but that's not you anymore. You're just going to have to swallow that pill. You know what I mean? Yep. Yep. What so was it hard did- for you? Oh yeah, when you, bro, hundred percent, man. You did know, you have people in your old crew like being like, "The fuck are you doing, bro?" Yeah, yeah, brother. Yep. So it was, it was a mission, man. And even myself, you know, because the crew was sort of a part of me as well. Like having to turn my back on it and um, you know, sort of walk away. That was a mission, bro. You know, it was a, it was a huge mission. Um, so I consider like a big part of it too. <laughs> you know what I mean? But yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's all about stepping up and being a man sometimes, you know. And um Yeah, I mean it's like yeah. a it, again, it's like this cliche. You grow up and you watch all these videos and they say like all, all the movies that I'm sure you and I both love, you know, there's only two outcomes like dead or in jail, dead or in jail, dead or in jail. And and in the same movies, there's like the dad that's like going to work every day is always like the the best character in the movie. But you know, sometimes we're so dumb that like we actually ignore all the, the the messages that are in our face for the you know we just yeah. we just ignore all that shit and think it's a game right? we think everything's a movie until you're fucking standing over a hole and your mates fucking lying in it and you're throwing dirt in it you know what i mean so how did that whole process go of um walking away from the club bro you know like um how did that sort of work just had to let it go man yep oh it was a it's a bit of a complicated one man but um yeah, because I, I wasn't really involved in the club for probably a year, a year and a half before I let, officially left, you know what oh, I mean? Yeah. So they kind of knew what was happening. Um, yeah, they were they were very good about it, man. But I don't know if, again, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe some of them weren't, you know what yeah. I mean? I don't know. But they, yeah, I haven't got a bad worth. Uh, I haven't got anything bad to say about them, man. Like, I, I, th- I think, you know. But it's a different world now anyway. I probably don't know anyone in there, in there anyway. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, oh, everyone I knew was, 
is either in jail or kicked out or murdered or do you know what I mean? Like there's, yeah. do you know what I mean? So, so man, so going through all of that stuff, man, growing up in Daily Long, bro, the bikey scene, um, you've seen a fair bit from there. So, I mean, going on to now, so, man, you're killing it now, man. I swear, bro, like, honestly, bro, you're an inspiration, man. Someone that I definitely look up into, look up to and what I'm doing. Like, um, so, man, you've traveled the world, man, as a journalist, uh, Vice News, this, that. So, how did that all start for you, man? How did that sort of man, all get was, rolling for you? Like, um, after you had left, man, like, after you had left the club, like, um, how man, did that... I'm telling you, it was, it was luck. Like, I... Uh, oh, because I studied, I studied art, art when I was in uni, before yeah, yeah. all the club and all the, all the drugs and all that, and so I um. I, I came out and I uh, I knew some guys who were involved in like extremism, you know what I mean, and um, I wanted to make a docker about them, and I was. There was a girl I knew who was like, helping me make it, and she was like, I know, uh, that's my geese. <laughs> yeah. Um, she was um she was trying to help me put this documentary together and she knew the editor at Vice at the time. She was like, you should ask them and she set up a meeting and I told them about this documentary about these um radical Muslim extremists in the suburbs from from our from our area. But then all these raids happened and they all got arrested and fucking put straight in Arcasia, you know what I mean? Like yeah, some no, of these guys were like 17. Yeah, yeah. yeah, like that was that whole Anzac thing, eh? Yeah, I think so. I think so. And then um, the guy was like, "Man, you should just write write it for us." And I was like, "I've never fucking written for anyone, but I just I just wrote another story for them and I sent them that." And then he was like, "Got me back in the office." He's like, "Man, do you want a column?" I didn't even know what a column was, but and he was like, "We'll give you a job. Just gonna write like once a week for us and like freelance." You know what I mean? And so I did that. And I was doing it for a while and they were really into it. And then eventually they were just like, man, if you write for us whenever you want, we'll pay you. And I was like, bro, it's like I could write for you every day. Like, that's easy money. Like, yeah. are you serious? Like, it takes me like an hour, it takes me an hour, jump on the phone, like interview someone and write it up. And that's you're gonna pay me for that? And like, <laughs> yeah, bro. And then and then I was like, fine. And then I was just I was doing one every single day. Like just doing bashing out one a day, to the point where it was cheaper. It would have probably I, when I did the math, it was cheaper for them to hire me than to keep paying me like that. And then they gave me a job, man. And then I started making documentaries, and I did the one four documentary. Um, oh, true, was that you? Yeah, yeah, I made that. I made um, I made a couple of like, uh, I did one with this guy Graham Abbott Henry, who was like an old. New South Wales crim involved in like a whole bunch of dark shit where the you know the coppers were basically green lighting this crew to do whatever they wanted you know what I mean throughout yeah. Sydney in the eighties and that um, I went to Japan interviewed the yakuza did a did a bunch of sick stories man it was just like a while I just couldn't fucking I still can't fully believe it man that these guys <laughs> just gave me a job man like, but that's <laughs> the, that's what vice was it was a bit fucking. It was a bit wild back then, you know what I mean? Like, they were just these young, young guys who were willing to take big risks, you know, and just hire people that were off the cuff and and tell them, like, if you want to, can you go get that story? Go make that story. So I did. Every every day was a different story that I had to get obsessed with and work on it and write it up and then move on to the next and just keeping my mind busy, you know what I mean? Like, trying to, trying to get myself out of any rut, you know what I mean? Like, just just keeping busy like that like some people do that in the gym some people you know maybe smoke a blunt to do that or whatever like for me it was i found i found that in work oh, but did yeah. you ever spin out uh, yeah when you were in jail like you had you working for weeks and weeks for like no money like that yeah, no, surely no. someone must have thought about that like 
where who's making money off this like yeah oh yeah now nah, we always used to that's a topic of convo bro <laughs> yeah, you know there's yeah. a hospital at port phillip bro that gets millions millions of dollars every year bro but, but i doubt much of that goes into that hospital <laughs> you know what i mean yeah, so yeah, yeah. rabbit hole on rabbit hole man i could talk about that stuff all day brother <laughs> trust me <laughs> yeah, I'm here for it. man that's why i love your fucking work bro that's yeah i can talk about that it's an insight that no one else is you know you don't get that from anywhere else bro yeah, yeah it's, a, it's it's important what you do man this thing of it's like you know we don't talk to police like we don't talk to you know that, that's part of the code you know this oh murder thing you know what i mean like don't talk you know but but then it's like well if you don't if you don't tell your story to anybody like sure don't no one's saying give statements to the cops because that's uh, you know mm. no one's saying that but at the same time, it's not don't don't tell your story to no one because then the cops are the only one that are going to tell your story. Do you know what I mean? It's yeah, important. no, one hundred percent, but one hundred percent, like man, even with that whole oh murder thing and no comment thing, man, it's overrated, bro. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah, um, yeah. even with me, bro. Like when I started, you know, like climbing up the ranks and you start getting around with heavier people in that bro you know like um people would be surprised you know what i mean like there's a lot of people that talk to, there's a lot of people that talk to the police bro you know what i mean there's a lot you know what i mean i know people i know people with patches and presidents that are that are no good bro you know what i mean they're no good but it's just it's I'm just sure. that whole politics fucking shit you know what i mean you would have to but, be so naive to think you can get so far in that world yeah, without exactly. people knowing what you're doing these, yeah. these people there's there's all these and then of the people on the on the bottom like the bottom feeders are the one that are like i oh, wouldn't make statements it's like yeah but your bosses do exactly right yeah, brother. Yeah. exactly right yeah. that's what i mean when you start climbing in ranks in that world then you realize fuck that code doesn't this code doesn't mean anything i know i know blokes that done big stints for other people man and no. the money no. that they got for it Bro, like, man, that's that's the real dog, man. That's a dog move, bro. bro like, not, like, like the, you know, like giving them that little amount of money and they did that much time for you for, for, man, like, fuck, man. I don't know how you could live with yourself, like, yeah, you exactly know what I mean? Money. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? all right man so uh man we're coming we're drawing to the end here man i could talk with you yeah, for a man. couple more hours though brother for real. <laughs> yeah, <man. laughs> when you yeah, ever if you time, ever come bro. to new zealand bro fuck but hey look 100. um like what's sort of your message bro to someone that is sort of um i guess you know for someone watching that is sort of caught up in the gang scene it is becoming a little bit much they're sort of struggling to sort of find that way out i guess like what would you, what would be your message to them, bro? Just sort of um to say to them, man. I, I don't even know. I don't even know if my advice is actually worth anything. Do you know what I mean? But I would be like, man, that a lot of I think people at the end of the day, at the end of the day, no matter how whatever world you're in, I think people are genuinely good people. Like I'm an optimist like that, and I think if you are honest to someone and you and you tell them what you want in life and, and like you want to you want to do this like and you've been loyal and you've never fucked up and you've never dogged on anyone or anything like that I, i'm sure people most people in that world if they're worth any any respect um they would they would be like man you fucking do what you, you gotta do you do what you do and fucking we'll back you 100 percent. that's if they're true men do you know what i mean but if they're if they're snaky cunts they might fucking slap you with a fine or whatever i don't know do you know what i mean i don't know but but i i genuinely i still have hope and a lot of optimism for people you know what i mean and i, I still think if you if you if you're if you're a man of your word and you go to another man who's a man of their word and you say you know i want to i want to do this this new path now they'll fucking support you I, I i hope they would you know i hope they would and if they don't man you just gotta just do you do you, bro, man? Like, like you know, I see, I see you running around doing all sorts of shit on your ones, man. Sometimes you just got to do shit on your ones, bro. Do you know yeah, what I mean? Like, bro. you just got to cut cut that world out and leave it behind you and start fresh and just do you, man. And, and just, but know that you know you started a new path now and don't look back. You know what I mean? 
Yeah, exactly right. Wise words from a wise man. <laughs> my <laughs> brother, my, my word for it, bro. <laughs> Don't take my fucking word for it. <laughs> I'm just G'd up because it's a Friday, bro. <laughs> yeah, me too, bro, bro. Me too. <laughs> Ah, uh, look, man, we'll better wrap it up there, brother. Um, right, brother. But, man, much love, much respect, bro. And um, we'll talk soon, brother. Likewise, man. I love what you do, bro. Keep doing it.